I've always been an artist since since I can remember. Uh, I remember I used to try drawing as a child. Um, my brothers, my, I have a big brother who's a really good artist. He just sketches from his head and he sketches really good things. And I always wanted to do things like him. And my dad, as I've told you, he's the ultimate artist. He can draw, he can paint, he can imitate, he can do a lot of good things. And all my other siblings are also artists. Well, my name is Sarah Dominique and I come from Congo and I have lived in Denmark for the past nine years here in Olbo. I used to live in a little city outside of Olbo in the south called Stirring. That's where I landed when I came here. And then I moved here four years after living there. And I am 30 years old, 31. <laughs> I just turned 31 last month. And yeah, I don't know. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you said that you're from Congo. Yes. Uh, which part of Congo? You know, there's a two Congo. Oh, yeah. Which one, where? Um, I'm from the big Congo, uh, DRC. The Democratic Republic of Congo. Yes. All right. Yes, and uh, we lived in Goma, which is the east part. East. Yeah. Which is the site where now I've got a kind of uh, conflict. Yes, there, right? yes, been going on for forever now. I hope, uh, I hope uh, this will one day be over so that's the prayer a beautiful country yeah i had I've never been to congo but i had this beautiful uh country yeah and it's, it's very gorgeous big. yeah um, only i haven't been there since i was 10. so i remember everything it taught me and i remember the black soil because where i come from the soil is black and i have not seen black soil before again uh i mean i haven't seen it since then but I left when I was 10, and I remember m more tragic things than the good things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but I also love the fact that I'm from Congo because it made me me. I feel like a lot of things that I love about being African and just being a black person is because I was in Congo. I feel like nothing can beat that for me. I lived in Kenya as well, and I'm not saying Kenya is not an African country, but my roots from Congo made me navigate living in Kenya. I think if I had come from Kenya to live in Congo, I would have had a harder time than coming from Congo living in Kenya. So I, I love it, but then it's like a love-hate relationship. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you say that some uh, uh, bad thing that you recall from from Congo. Yeah. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yes, I'd love to hear exactly what the bad thing that you recall more in Congo than the good. Okay. Um, well, I'm I'm born in '89, so that's a long time ago, and the development of the place was not the best, or maybe it's just my parents who weren't rich, <laughs> uh, but there's that part of the development way back when i was a kid and also the wars i experienced around four wars when i was a child and there was a major one that dispersed us and made us flee to kenya and i i saw the whole thing happen i saw people fleeing in the streets i saw people getting shot at i saw my father getting shot and falling onto the ground and lying in his own pool of blood and we still have to flee to save ourselves and save him he's still alive right now thank god yes he's still alive going on strong <laughs> um but when i think back to congo and this war happened for two weeks that we were away and it was outrageous we went to live in a refugee camp in our own country where we had to hide and we didn't eat and People, we, we had to keep getting displaced from refugee camp to refugee camp and trying to save our lives, not knowing if we're gonna make it tomorrow. And I was around seven at the time. And we were there for two weeks and then the war ended and we had to walk back home where we walked for I think two days. And when we got home and my mom said we were away for two weeks, I was like, no, that felt like two years. <laughs> like, that was two weeks. So, and then a few, a year after we left to Kenya, or like two years after. And I think, when I think back to Congo, 
I remember a little bit of the good times when we speak with my family, but the main things I remember is these wars and they ended and they kept happening again and you just never know when it's going to break out. So that, that's the tragic part that I remember. It made me stronger to to kind of know how to live life and navigate through life, but also I think it scarred my brain for a long time that I felt like I had to keep being on the move because I was used to fleeing. So when I, yeah, when I got to Denmark, I, I didn't settle until like four years after because I thought I was going to go to the next place. That's, it's, it's in my head. I have to keep moving. Yeah. During the period that you were there in, yeah. in, in Congo, did you lost your friends? Yeah, unfortunately, yes, because when the war breaks out, it's man for themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm very blessed that I didn't lose my siblings or my parents. It's a wonder. It's, ma it's just the mercies of God. Not to say that God is not merciful to those who got lost. I just count myself blessed uh, because I, I remember, I, I remember hearing children calling out for their moms in the night and mothers and fathers calling out for their children and vice versa in the night. And I always try to hear if that somebody's going to answer, you know, and those are just random people I don't know, or maybe I know them because we're inside, we're not getting out. But when we came back, things were not the same. And some of our friends never came back to school, for example. And I know a neighbor who got shot and died so um you just hear that they left and they're not there anymore and you're happy that you're still here and yeah so yes i did lose friends in the war and also moving from congo to kenya i lost all of them <laughs> and I, I can't quite remember my friends but a magic happened last year i went to belgium for a festival and i met somebody that i went to school with and i was in fourth grade with her wow. it was just amazing <laughs> and yeah so yeah oh, wow fantastic <laughs> yeah uh, you were saying that uh, your your life is being on move yeah how it is putting yourself not just you are putting yourself but how it is living on the move you went yeah. to congo and you went to kenya we're going to talk about life in kenya yeah and now you know all this place that you went through yeah how is life on the move it's not fun <laughs> yeah it's life on the move is I would wish that I never moved at all because I am very grounded, very grounded. I can live in one corner for 100 years and I will be fine because I, I don't like the moving. But beyond that, it's, it means readjusting every time you move. You have to integrate, you have to make new friends, you have to start a new life, and you have to forget about your old life because it doesn't serve you anymore. It might serve you, but you can't live in two places in one time. So uh, the physical is okay, you can handle that because you just have to grab your bags, get a new place. But the mental and the emotional is really, really hard. Um, because most of my family still lives in Africa and in Congo. And we, they are my cousins and my aunties, and we are around the same age. So, I, the the people that know me and I know them, I haven't seen in almost twenty years. Um, no one waits for no one. Life has to keep moving. So, on the mental and the emotional part, it's really hard because that's just like when you cope with it but when it affects you as a sickness which i thought i i realized that i had is because i i wasn't here even when i got to denmark not because somebody said i had to go to somewhere else but i was just used to i'm going to be here for just a short while and maybe i might keep going my brain was set up like that and and then that made me so so sad for a long time because i kept expecting for things to happen i don't know what <laughs> and then i realized wait i think it's already set up in my mind that i have to keep moving but i don't plan on moving from here so i might as well just land <laughs> and then i i landed and 
but even when you land it's, it's Denmark there's a lot of laws and stuff which you probably even wish you were going to another place sometimes so yeah on the mental it's really hard but physically you can adjust physically I'm okay I, as long as it's comfortable where I'm living and I have a bed I have a couch um, that's I have an apartment that's okay but mentally it's really rough yeah before we come to Denmark, uh, yeah. you left Congo to Kenya. Yeah. Uh, tell us about life in Kenya. Or mm. How did you manage to move, uh, yeah. escape from Congo <laughs> to uh, Kenya? Okay. <laughs> I'm laughing because it was a, <laughs> it's a, it's a funny story. <laughs> um, so my dad got a chance to get to Kenya before us. And he left us in Congo because he had to find a way out. And he left, and a few months after we followed him, but the situation was not the best. Like we just didn't get air tickets and flew to Kenya. We used the buses from Kenya to we pa from Congo, sorry, through Rwanda, through Uganda, and finally through Kenya. Yeah, um, the journey was wild because you know <laughs> Rwanda is full of hills. And we were on a bus. It was my first time on a long drive <laughs> ride on a bus. And I threw up the whole time. And we all did. It was crazy. We were not prepared. <laughs> Nobody warned us that it was going to be that bad. Um, and it was just us and my mom. And we got to Kenya. And my dad had hustled himself a place. Because life in Kenya is really hard. It's really tough, especially in Nairobi. I think if you live a bit outside of the big cities, it's maybe easier. But then, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so my, my dad lived in Nairobi in a small little place. And I remember when we got there and we arrived. So we finally arrived with the last bus and he came to pick us. And then we took a taxi to where he lived. And I was so disappointed. <laughs> I was only 10 years old, and I remember getting into the house. It was such a little, little house, and we were many. I have um, uh, seven siblings. Okay. Yes, so we were all of us, and I kept wishing we were going to go to the real house the next day because I was just like, we're coming from a really good place, and I don't want to live here, but I had to. It was a shock. It was a very big shock. I started getting shocked from when I was 10 years old. <laughs> Life has been rough. Um, and there we had to speak English in Kenya and we had to go to school, but clearly my dad didn't have a job good enough to take us to school. And by the time, by the, right now, prim, public primary school education is free, but at the time we arrived, it wasn't. And we couldn't speak. There's a Swahili spoken in Kenya, which is different from the Swahili spoken in Congo, which meant that we couldn't communicate with the other kids. So uh, me being shy and very introverted, I didn't try until I had perfected my Swahili so I can go out and play. But I remember my little brother, I, c I remember hearing him playing with the kids outside and he would say some things and they would just laugh at him and they would feel so bad for him. But I guess he was okay because <laughs> he was okay with it. And I remember just teaching myself some, my dad had a French English dictionary with pictures and I just kept reading that dictionary the whole time. And so we had to go to school at some point, and that's when, no, when we arrived, we had to register ourselves with the UNHCR because we are refugees and we need some sort of identification living in Kenya. Um, and the, the trips to the UN offices to go and get an appointment so that you can get your story hard in an interview. We must have done it, I think, for two years without getting lucky. And it's always so full of people. You get there, it's all sorts of refugees from all around the world. And you spend the whole day there just waiting. Maybe somebody might come and talk to you and nobody comes and then they close. So you have to go back home. And we are like 10 people and you have to pay for transportation to get there. When we don't even have money for food, how do we get there? It was just so rough. Um, but things got better. We, my mom knew these nuns who were 
uh, sponsoring refugee kids and they had a an organization they were called little sisters of saint francis i think where they were offering a college education to young ladies and they, they could pay a, a certain amount of your school fees money and in return your the parents have to go work in their in their fields and then they get a little food to come back home with so we lived like that for a while and we eventually got to go to a school a public school in Kenya it was so hard <laughs> it was cuz <laughs> uh, it's all english or swahili and we spoke french and swahili but from congo but then we were thrown into a school cuz we have to go to school right. and we have to perform and surprisingly though i wasn't the last in class <laughs> i don't know so what the we last person <laughs> Yes, lessons. yes. But the Swahili, Swahili in Congo is really uh, completely different from Swahili spoken in... Uh, yes, quite. Yeah, but yes, well, we have a lot of good vocabularies right. that are spoken in the pure Swahili. It's called Swahili Sanifu. That's like clean. But then we have a lot of French and Lingala and all, all ah, these things okay. mixed. Yeah. So you can't just speak the way you speak in Congo and Kenya. You have to twist it. You really have to change it. So I can speak both. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I love languages, so it wasn't really hard to catch, and I listened to a lot of music, and um, um, some of the teachers were kind enough to teach some of the lessons in Swahili for me, for my sake. I thought that was really, really kind of, mm -hmm. like, science in Swahili, that's hard. <laughs> and they would say that they're doing it for me, and I loved math, and... Uh, I, I just found my way. Also, I was young. I was around 10, 11. So that was easy to get along and just understand. Yeah, we just had to get with the program, I guess. Yeah. And, and then we got a chance to go to a private school three years after. Yes, which was tough, but it was among the best things that ever happened to me because it it made me clear school in a good light and I got to go to a really good high school. And from there is when I get to Denmark and how I got here. <laughs> then I arrived here and I had other people and we were put in a in a in an old high school high school in Stirring, the little town. But when I arrived here, so I, I used to be encouraged to become a translator. That's, those are the jobs that I thought I could get. So I remember we came from the airport here in Auburn and our translator, he's from Congo, he came and picked us. And I could speak French, English, I could speak all these languages, but then you just have to go with the law and the rules. And I asked him, that was the last energy I had before I lost it all. <laughs> How did you get your job? And he just looked at me and he laughed. <laughs> And I was like, that's it, God, I tried. <laughs> From now on, I, I think I remember I couldn't feel anything when I arrived. When you ask me how I felt when I came here, I can't tell you because I, I don't know. I could see the snow falling. It was in February of 2011. We still had snow. I don't know what happened to the snow. <laughs> and I could see it falling. I've seen it in the movies. Yeah, it's nice. But it was cold and everything. But I can't quite remember feeling all those things mm. until I think a few months after. And I could see the leaves and the plants and the flowers starting to come out. Somebody had to keep pointing those things out for me to notice because I don't know where I was. I was just, I was lost. Then I said, okay, this is my moment to now get into starting to know my community and my Congolese people. I, I, normally, I don't go out and talk to people. My mom just kept us like that. We're always in the house. Uh, now I had to do this by myself, getting social. And I tried, but that wasn't the best thing also for me because people are different and you have to know people before you just open up and say things. And I didn't have that. And because I'm African, if you're African, we're doing this together, but people are different again. Yeah. So I had to learn that the hard way. And, but I was going to post school. I got finally, after a few months, they got me a place in this post school and I enjoyed that so much because I love languages. And 
a few months into my first grade of the school school i already learned everything because i didn't have anything to do so i was just going home and reading the book and i love languages again so i was having so much fun so i finished the curriculum and i asked the teacher can i go to now dansk three two or something he was like no 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 you have to wait for a year because then you have to do it for three years but I have learned it all. You can see that I have. And sometimes I would be in class and he would be like, do you want to go help the other students because they have a couple of questions? I am not the teacher. I am not here to do your job. Give to p Take me to the next level. And they kept saying no. And I had to push. And eventually they, he came one day with the best news ever, said, you can go to the next level. And I was so happy. And there I did my thing so fast again. And I wanted to be moved to the other level. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I still tried. And I did. So in 10 months, I was done with my Danish course. That was really good. I was, I was happy about that. Yeah. And then I thought after that I was going to join university, but that's when now the trouble starts because they say you need to have this subject, you need to have this subject, you do this subject, they're like, mm, no, you should have had math as well. Why didn't nobody say this from the beginning? And I spent three years at HOF where I did an entire HOF. Then I enrolled in university and I got the place, but my depression was getting at its peak and in 2015, I just lost it all. And I was now fully depressed. I was like my mind, I think I lost my mind and I lost my, my movement. I, I was like a, a vegetable. It was gone. I, I was just, I couldn't remember yesterday. I couldn't remember three years ago. I couldn't remember anything. And I couldn't think of forward. I was, I think, it's, you know, like I was dead. <laughs> I can say that. And I was so scared because I've never felt like that in my life. And the thing that kept me alive is my dream. I always dream of making other people's lives better who have been like me. So if I have to do that, I have to be active and alive. So I always try to get back to a place that can allow me to do that. And when I lost all these things, I had gone away from a lot of people that I knew. I had really secluded myself and I can do that so well, but at this point it was detrimental to my own health. And then, I was so anxious, I was so scared, I couldn't talk. Everything I said was always wrong. Uh, everything I heard, I felt like it was attacking me. I was just, it wasn't me. I, I was a completely different person. And I was scared to tell my family because at this time, my family is in the States. And they know me, I'm always bubbly. I'm the one who just makes everybody laugh. And I'm just, that's me. And I didn't want to lose that to them. So when they would call, I would try to act that. And they would, they fell for it. <laughs> A lot of people fell for it because I think I know how to hide it. Uh, but when I, and then in school, I was doing language and international studies. Um, as an African person, that's not the course I should have taken because it just triggered me all through. It has nothing to do with me yet. It's supposed to talk about the world and world tragedies, but it doesn't mention all these things that have happened to me. Yeah. And also there's nothing about African studies. So literally no one knows who I am and no one cares. Um, and I was, I had lost my speech. So I would just be angry, but I can't speak. <laughs> Um, I got, I got triggered a lot. And so I had to, I lost some of the semesters. I had to take off and I would come back and redo them. Um, and I realized that I was at a place that I needed psychiatric help. But as soon as I thought about that, I also felt the fear because I'm, I, I thought if I, if I can diagnose myself because I know myself and I read about mental illnesses, I felt like I had them all because I could feel them all. Right. And I didn't want to be an experiment. 
I, when I thought about psychiatric help, I was like, no, they may just want to do a brain surgery on me. <laughs> and if somebody's going to mess up my brain, it's going to be me. <laughs> so I'm, I've always been an artist all my life. I draw, I write calligraphy. Yes. Yeah. Now we let's go through the, to the art. To the art. Yeah. Okay. Impressive to hear all this story. I would love to ask you many questions. Uh, and you talk well as well. Oh, I thank you. you. you, talk, you talk. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So let's talk about art. Yeah. Um, how it started. Yeah. So I've always been an artist since since I can remember. Uh, I remember I used to try drawing as a child. Um, my brothers, my, I have a big brother who's a really good artist. He just sketches from his head and he sketches really good things. And I always wanted to do things like him. And my dad, as I've told you, he's the ultimate artist. He can draw, he can paint, he can imitate, he can do a lot of good things. And all my other siblings are also artists. My little brother is an artist. My other brother makes upholstery, so chairs and stuff. My other sister is a tailor who made the dress. We're all artists in the house, and my mom is a teacher. It's only my mom who can't draw, <laughs> but she can draw by telling stories. So, um, I, I enjoyed doing it, just trying to draw. And we had dessin, which is art and craft in school in Congo, so we could always practice. And then in Kenya, when I went to high school, I took art in as a subject. But then I, I didn't I didn't like the class, so I, I I cancelled that and took French instead, and that was easier for me. Free points because I could speak French. Anyway, um, then I came here, and for the first time, I touched a brush and paint in 2011 when I came here because I could afford to buy it. It was I felt like it was more affordable compared to back home, or maybe I had the funds, and. I, I met a very good artist lady called Gerda in Stirring. She's very good. And she gave me some art materials and some books where I could train myself to paint realistically. She gave me canvases. A lot of people heard that I was an artist, but I wasn't so serious about it. And they would give me art materials, but I was going through all the things that I've told you I was going through, so I didn't really have time to do my art. So just here and there, and then I took a break and I forgot about it. And when I lost myself, I, didn't, I wasn't doing any art thing. So when I needed to come back and I had zero in me, I remembered that I had a talent. And at this point, I felt like I was melting. Every time I tried to stand up, I was melting. And I wanted to bring myself up and build myself again. And so I said, I literally prayed to, God, to, to my talent, <laughs> if I can say that. I said, I know that you're in there somewhere. If you're still in there, just come out. I'm going to try to practice you again. And hopefully you're going to save me. And so I... Somebody had given me a canvas for my Christmas present, and they had paid for the, for, I could frame it when I was done. Mm -hmm. And they said, when you're done, just go to the store and they can frame it for you. So I had to put something on that canvas, and I wanted to draw as simple shapes as possible because I, w I wanted to rebuild myself from scratch, so things I can see and feel. And also I needed to put color back into my life. <clears throat> so I, I thought of like a coloring book, but on canvas instead. So I, and also I wanted to draw images from things I can remember. So I wanted to revive my memory again. So I remember we had a guitar and my brother used to teach me how to play the guitar. My dad had a binoculars and a radio. And there's a thing about music as well. I loved music, but at this point, I wasn't even listening to music, which was very scary. So I started, I painted a guitar. I Googled a picture of a guitar, but I wanted to make it as simple as I can. So I just drew it in my head. I, it's like, I, yeah. And I painted the different shape, different, I divided it into sections. And I wanted to paint straight lines, but not using tape because I wanted to also like tame myself. Just, I didn't want to go into my brain at all for no reason, for anything. Because if I went into my brain, it was bad in there. But I thought I wanted to paint and go there and just stick there so that I can just bring myself back. And then I painted the guitar 
And when I looked at it, it was a lovely image, but I was still with so much anger and hatred inside of me, so I didn't really love it. But it was a pretty picture, so it was like a very weird relationship with it. And I put it out online, and people thought it was so nice. And my neighbors, when they came into my room, they thought it was so pretty. The way it made them feel made me feel so good, because that's what I was going for for me, even if I wasn't there yet. And I thought, hmm, I, I have to keep going. And so I cut out my school. I started to paint. I, I stopped thinking of school. I focused on painting. Every time I would get my SU, I would buy a canvas and I would come home and paint. And it excited me so much. I didn't know how much it was healing me, but it was exciting me. And I kept doing it and I kept doing it and I just, more ideas kept coming into my head. And eventually I made way too many paintings for the place I was living, so I didn't have space.